Egyptian airfields. Rockets, bombs, napalm, everything we had. The whole war had been sparked by a false Soviet report of a threat to Syria. Now that Israel was actually attacking Syria, the Soviets were forced to react. Word came through, the hotline was up, and I didn't know what it was about because I, I thought that the war was pretty well over. Nevertheless, I went back immediately to the White House. The usual suspects were there, McNamara and, and the rest. And we had a, a rather hairy message from the Russians. The Soviets made very clear they would intervene militarily. And very likely, they would not only turn Israel back from its attack on Syria, but they would join Syria in an effort to, uh, to deal a mortal blow to Israel. It was a very, very dangerous situation. The Soviets did not seem to be bluffing. Strategic Bomber Command in the Ukraine had received orders to prepare four squadrons to fly to the battle zone. It was all arranged in a great hurry. We were given strict instructions not to suffer any casualties. The loss of even one Soviet aircraft would betray our involvement. But we saw this was unrealistic, so we had to find another way. The pilots were then ordered to leave behind all identification. Their planes were to be repainted in Egyptian colors. Our red stars are only one color, red. But it turned out that now we needed four different colors. I remember green and black and something else, maybe red. But we didn't have the right colors. So that caused a lot of fuss. In the White House Situation Room, President Johnson and his staff worked out their response to the Soviet ultimatum. The president sent a message over the hotline telling the Kremlin that he was using every means to get the Israelis to stop the war. This was not strictly true. Although he could have phoned the Israeli prime minister directly, he phoned the Israeli ambassador to the UN instead. United States Ambassador Goldbeck asked me to come out into the lobby and to send to say to me, you must immediately, immediately announce that the fighting is over. This was not within the Israeli ambassador's power, so he asked his boss, Abba Ibn, to phone the prime minister. But Eshkol was with his generals on the Golan Heights. Suddenly, Abba Ibn calls and says, tell Eshkol to stop the war. We're under terrible pressure here at the United Nations. Then Eshkol calls me and he says, ah, this Golan is absolutely fantastic. The view is wonderful. He waxes lyrical about it. And I tell him, Eshkol, listen, Iban wants you to stop the war. He can't take the pressure. He said, I can't hear you. What do you mean you can't hear me? I'm telling you in Iban's exact words. He says, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. It's a bad line. It's a bad line. I'll come home and then we'll talk. And then I understood. They wanted time to conquer some more kilometers. The Israelis pressed on into the Golan and encountered no Soviet forces because President Johnson had raised the stakes. He asked McNamara what distance from the Syrian coast the fleet, American fleet, was at the time, and he said 100 miles. It was steaming toward, uh, toward Gibraltar.